My name is Kevin Hodgkins, and I am presenting a paper against the third sector as a contrivance of the state. Um, so this is a, a, the paper that uh, hopefully all of y'all will read and will be made available is uh, on the historical foundations of modern nonprofit firms. It's uh, the, the first of a uh, four parts of my thesis for my master's in public administration degree. And in the thesis, uh, review historical foundations, uh, economic theories of nonprofits, uh, review capital market theories, and then application of history and theory to uh, uh, a new equity-like capital market uh, for charity and philanthropy. <clears throat> so today I'd like to uh, set out to reframe the third sector rubric uh, notion that charity exists separately from uh, the private, commercial, and government sectors. Uh, second, I'll show some commonalities between uh, the commercial and nonprofit business firms. And third, show the danger of increased government intervention in a historically independent sector of the economy. Okay, so let's talk about the modern third sector. Well, this was a concept that was really first introduced in 1975, so it's a very recent concept that uh, is has really just completely taken over. I think uh, most of us have probably heard the terms either third sector or independent sector uh, when talking about nonprofit institutions, charities, philanthropies or what I like to say, uh, private voluntary assistance for social needs. So this was uh, uh, put together uh, by the Commission on Private Philanthropy and Public Needs, uh, commonly called the Filer Commission uh, for the Chair. Uh, the commission was put together by uh, John Rockefeller uh, III and uh, presented their findings to Congress in 1979. So in, that, uh, in the commission report, the uh, third or independent sector is reframed as separate from private commercial and governmental sectors of the economy, even though there is a thousands year long history uh, tradition of, uh, you know, of course the terms nonprofit weren't used, but a thousands of year tradition of uh, private voluntary assistance for public or social needs. Also, the third sector in this paper is said to basically live and, buy, uh, live and die by the tax deductibility of donations. Um, Again, you know, we didn't have personal income taxes in the United States until the 20th century. So, you know, what the heck about all the money that we've been giving for thousands of years for social needs voluntarily? Uh, so, the the third sector, not by the Pilot Commission report, uh, but just generally, the third sector is primarily defined by nonprofit distribution constraint. So, you can make profits, you just can't give them out to owners. Um, recognition of special exemptions in tax law and the voluntary nature of its activities for a non-private or a public benefit. <clears throat> so why is the third sector important uh, as a field of study? Um, start here and say uh, approximately 10% of U.S. GDP comes from the third sector, from nonprofits and charitable institutions. 7% of the civilian workforce, or if you include volunteer hours, 10% of the civilian workforce in the United States comes from this sector. They have over $3 trillion in capital assets uh, on their books as of two years ago. Um, so I'd say it went up, but it probably just went back down. So we'll say for around $3 trillion in asset value. And interestingly, over the past two decades, they have seen double the growth rate in revenues, in asset values, and in the number of firms that the private commercial sector has seen. So that's kind of interesting. Why all of a sudden have we had this explosion of nonprofit firms? Of course, I think we probably know some of the reasons. Uh, another thing here that, that I'd like to say that I think is important about the third sector, um, Aristotle uh, claimed that, that where there is friendship, justice is not necessary. And Aristotle friendship was an, any association of mutual advantage where both parties uh, uh, contributed to the transaction. So. Uh, the third sector is important because it helps build the kind of social trust that is necessary for commerce. Um, with, without uh, private action for non-private means only, uh, the, the trust that we have in society can be damaged. And then we can end up allocating more resources to defining trust, making sure that we're not getting built in transactions than just going on and committing commerce. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the sources of revenue. Um, this is a chart from the NCCS, uh, National Nonprofit Research Database. And we see that nonprofit institutions receive about 44% of their uh, 
of their revenue from fees and charges. That number is actually 71% if you include the regular fees and charges with government reimbursements for fees and charges, primarily from Medicare and Medicaid, other government programs. So they actually receive 71% of the revenue from fees and charges. Of course, most of us uh, paid uh, uh, fees and charges to a nonprofit institution to attend here. I, I just don't know what the percentage is for this institute. But, uh, so government reimbursements for charges, 27%. Direct government grants, 9%. Individual giving, 12.5%. And then investment income, again, <coughs> two years ago, 4%. Probably going to be negative this year. Um, so this is interesting. Where I received this graph from showed the 71% in a really small footnote to talk about uh, you know, how uh, a, a, a large percentage of the fees and charges came from government reimbursements. So in the, in the literature, you normally don't see, you just see this little tiny slip, government only gives 9% of charities. Of course it's not, it's actually 36%. Okay. Uh, on this slide, I just want to show you a little bit more about the third sector, why it's important. So this is as, as a share of revenue, which of course approximates uh, uh, you know, if, if their economic impact. So healthcare uh, makes up almost 60% of the nonprofit sector. And then education, um, so institutions of, of higher education and private schools make up uh, about 16%. And then human services, what a lot of us traditionally think of as charity, uh, the human services field and the public benefit field together is about 19%. And then we have a little bit more. Uh, this uh, nonprofit chart obviously does not include churches. Uh, we do have a little bit down here for religion, non direct church aid, but uh, uh, churches are, are typically not included in regular discussions on nonprofits. Okay, so the sector is contrived by the state. 36% of the revenue is derived from government sources. Uh, increased government grants and payments for service have led to a huge increase in the number of firms, especially over the past 50 years. Tax changes in the 20th century, of course, precipitated a change from a for-profit form, proprietary forms of organization for the firm, into nonprofit, especially in healthcare, uh, and in research, and in education. And we can see that less than 50% of the third sector that we have today is uh, uh, actively exists in, in what is historically based uh, charity and philanthropy. Okay, so now that's interesting. Also, we take out that, that 50% and that double the growth goes back to the same growth rate as commercial firms over the past 20 years, uh, which is also something that's seen throughout history that there are a lot of similarities between nonprofit firms and for profit firms. They grow together over time. They're highly interdependent on one another. So now I'd like to move on and talk a little bit about what's actually in, in my paper. Uh, this first part is on the historical foundations of charity and philanthropy. So we find some universal themes uh, reviewing the literature. Uh, first and most important is that voluntary assistance addressing social needs is absolutely consistent uh, through, uh, through history, both time and place. So, all right, so in the paper, which again, I, I truly hope all of y'all will read and, and provide a comment on, uh, I take the reader through, uh, through a, a, a journey through ancient China, Persia, into Judea, Greece, and Rome, up into Christian Europe, uh, Islamic Asia, uh, into the colonial period, and into the modern world. So I, I kind of trace the history of charity and philanthropy all the way through. Now there's some great books available, um, and, and I have a 40 page paper, so I've tried to uh, you know, uh, make it a little bit more concise as just a foundation for my thesis. Next, voluntary assistance is consistent regardless of state provision uh, of, of resources to address social needs. Um, early Christian church assistance uh, is, is an example of this. Um, in ancient Rome, when the when the church started, the state didn't provide any uh, any social services. You know, um, they did, but very very small amount. So the early Christian church, and that's I, I think some of the uh, uh, religious historical literature says that that's part of how the church was able to grow, is they were able to build these bonds of community through providing assistance to those in need. Um, private non-religious assistance during uh, during a period of church dominance. So towards the uh, uh, 
towards the 15th century when, when the church in Europe uh, was beginning to run into financial troubles and they were no longer able to appropriately support those in need, uh, private parties came up and were able to support some of the needs. And uh, also in the historic religious literature, that's uh, given as part of, uh, part of the reason for the Protestant Reformation. Um, and then, of course, there has been by getting in socialist and dictatorial regimes as well. So we do see that, again, this voluntary system is consistent regardless of state provision. Third, voluntary assistance is entrepreneurial in addressing social needs. Uh, it was philanthropy that introduced the first savings banks. Um, these banks would, uh, of course, take in small savings subscriptions from uh, regular people. Normally, uh, with an income test, you couldn't you could uh, uh, join a savings bank unless you had under a certain amount of income. And then philanthropists and donations to the charity, the savings bank, would pay uh, typically a 5% interest rate back on this. Uh, mutual insurance, of course, was also started by, uh, by uh, philanthropic institutions, as was free education. <clears throat> uh, also entrepreneurial because many methods are used and tried by many different firms. I mean, this isn't like government provision of service where we say, okay, we're going to do it this way. No, we have many different firms doing many different things. And to me, that is part of the entrepreneurial approach, trying to do combinations of goods and services to meet a need. Uh, also, uh, voluntary assistance was extremely instrumental in, in the very growth of the U.S. commercial sector in the early republic. Uh, these savings banks and mutual insurance firms were huge capital aggregators. Uh, say on the largest of them had over $100 million inflation adjusted uh, in dollar assets. In a, a downturn in, uh, I don't remember exactly when, maybe between 1817 and 1820, uh, uh, there was a, a, a real a monetary crunch and, and there wasn't uh, liquid capital available. These folks had liquid capital. They made it available. So they took the cash out of their bank <coughs> and these things funded roads, canals, hospitals, schools, and commerce. Uh, the historian at the time in the 1830-something uh, of uh, Lowell Mills, so they had an on-site historian at the Lowell Mills, he said that, uh, that Massachusetts Life, which was uh, affiliated with, uh, with uh, uh, Massachusetts General Harvard University, uh, was the primary uh, provider of intermediate capital uh, for Lowell Mills expansion and specifically said that without that capital, Lowell Mills would not have been able to expand at the rate it did. Two minutes, okay. All right, so a couple more things here. We have uh, voluntary assistance has always been a first responder to new social needs. So they've introduced free education. They were the first to address the needs of urban poor uh, at, during a change from an agrarian to a, a, a commercial economy. They were first to address healthcare and medical research needs during periods of epidemics and plague. Uh, of course, some of our earliest great medical research comes from the Islamic world, and these were funded by, you know, non proprietary but private uh, business firms that are like charities today. Voluntary assistance is especially a bet during times of social upheaval. So we see during the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, uh, more charitable and philanthropic assistance was made available. Uh, we see during the Protestant and English Reformation, this is really when the, the, the sector exploded, was during the Protestant and English Reformation, because there was that need, and the need was met by private activity. And uh, like I said, we changed from agrarian to industrial age. Uh, last universal theme here is that voluntary assistance has always acted as a buffer against state hegemony. So uh, it's provided assistance to persecuted minorities in ancient Rome, medieval Europe, pre Civil War America, the modern world, of course, we know agitated for the end of slavery. Um, voluntary associational activity has helped to agitate for and fund the American Revolution itself. Um, you know, in a way, the uh, original Continental Congresses that did not have charter from the king, um, they were voluntary associations. And the original funding came from voluntary subscriptions. And then last, and, and uh, no less important, the Mises Institute itself. Uh, we here helped provide a buffer against the state of Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, so I'll run through these real quick. Uh, I did get the wrong one, sorry. All right, in conclusion, um, basically everything I just said, go on to one more conclusion slide. <laughs> I'm out of time. <laughs> um, the, the, I want to talk just very briefly about the power of Austrian economics in studying the third sector. So being here this week has, has 
helped me a lot. I was very interested in the number of presentations that touched on social entrepreneurship or a, a, you know sustainable business development. The nonprofit sector isn't just nonprofits. To, to me, it's really uh, those that are that are using private means uh, to to meet more than just a private end. Um, so there was a presentation yesterday on sustainability, and when we do that privately, it's great. When government coerces us to do it, it's bad. Uh, but the Austrian focus on subjective pricing, uh, individualism, entrepreneurship, firm, time value, and uncertainty has the ability to frame a voluntary private action for public gain within a holistic voluntary economy that right now is solely being studied uh, outside of you know, nonprofit management and business schools is solely studied in schools of public administration like I'm in. So we are teaching people to help meet these great social needs we're teaching them to do it the government way. And we're teaching them to do it with poor economics that can't even model nonprofit firms. The only reason nonprofit firms exist in classical economics is because of market failures. It's not a market failure. I want to do what I'm doing. All of us want to. 